Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today on this important occasion for your university and the center. My name is Jadi Prabhu. Before I get started, maybe I'll say a little bit about myself by way of background. Uh, I grew up in India where I studied engineering as an undergraduate and then went to the United States and switched to the business school and got a PhD at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles where the weather is a bit different from <laughs> Um, I, I then taught at UCLA, also in Los Angeles, and Tilburg University in the Netherlands before moving to the UK. I was in Cambridge for a few years, then Imperial College in London before returning to Cambridge to take up the position I currently have. Most of my research has been on innovation, and in the first half of my career, I studied innovation as it's done in developed economies in large corporations. And more recently, I've turned my gaze to emerging economies, particularly India, where I come from. And so I want to draw on some of this research in the course of this lecture. <coughs> the globalization of innovation, challenges, and opportunities posed by emerging economies. Now, there is a very large literature in management and in economics on the global location of innovation and R&D. And this literature had concluded by the end of the 20th century, that whatever else companies may offshore, manufacturing or back office stuff to places like China and India, they would keep R&D and innovation close to headquarters. And there were very good reasons for this. Uh, R&D is a significant investment, it's a strategic asset, you don't want it leaking out to competitors. Also, the nature of such knowledge is sticky or tacit. And it's very hard to transfer this across borders. And so R&D would stay close to home. And if it moved across borders, it would move to similarly developed economies, the so-called triad countries of Western Europe, North America, and Japan. So that was the conclusion of a long literature at the end of the 20th century. And if we look at this figure, I, I see that uh, it's somewhat small. You may not be able to see the fine print. These are the top 20 spenders on R&D in 2007. Together, they account for something like $128 billion of spending in one year. And you'll see that the column on headquarter location is all principally developed. There's one non-Western, shall we say, company there, and that's Samsung in South Korea. But even South Korea is now a developed economy. So if R&D stays close to home and headquarters, then it's no surprise that R&D would be in the developed countries. But in the 21st century, in the last 10 years or so, this has changed. And to see that, let's take GM, number two on this list, General Motors, which in 2007 spent eight billion on R&D. And if you look at where GM's R&D network is, we'll see, yes, the literature was correct, that in the 20th century, they had one R&D center in Warren, close to headquarters, and that was the only R&D center they had. But in the 21st century, in the 2000s, all this changed. In 2003, they set up their second R&D center, and they didn't set it up in one of the triad countries, they set it up in India. And since then, they've set up many others in China, Korea, Australia, Sweden, Russia, and so forth. So something seems to have changed. The business press caught on to this fairly early. This is a Business Week cover story from 2003, which talks about the outsourcing of innovation. First came manufacturing, it says, now companies are farming out R&D to cut costs and get new products to market faster. But it also says, are they going too far? Are the companies going to be giving away their strategic competitive advantage? Are countries that have competitive advantage, mostly developed countries, giving away their crown jewels by going to emerging economies? There was this fear. There was also the fear amongst policymakers and politicians that just as blue collar jobs had been lost to emerging economies, white collar jobs might also be lost. So this had been picked up quite early. And Business Week is stuck with this. This is a 2008 article which talks about the real boom in offshore R&D in Asia and Eastern Europe has occurred in the past six years when multinationals have begun hiring engineers and designers by the thousands and signing major outsourcing deals with foreign engineering 
Visit the huge Indian labs of companies like General Electric, Texas Instruments, IBM, etc. Look at the pharmaceutical industry and see the alliances they've formed and so on. So a major shift seems to be happening in the 2000s. And here's some photographic evidence. This concerns India primarily, and you'll see some leaders of Western businesses there. In the first box up there, you see uh, John Chambers of Cisco inaugurating Cisco's second headquarters in Bangalore, India. They call it Globalization Center East, and he's there with India's then prime, uh, president, uh, who was himself a scientist and a big promoter of Indian science and scientific capability. And then you see Sam Parmesano of IBM with the same president opening a big IBM R&D center. Bill Gates is frequently in India when he was CEO of Microsoft. This is him with the then <coughs> Minister of IT. And here in the bottom, you see Craig Barrett of Intel with the same minister. Announcing big R&D projects in various places in India. So uh, this raises all kinds of questions, and my co-authors and I have been looking at three questions that come out of this. First, how global is R&D <laughs> or innovation? Are there major trends towards doing R&D in emerging economies? If so, what are the drivers of R&D location? What has changed since the 20th century? Second, what types of R&D activities do multinationals do in these different locations? If they're setting up these big centers in places like India and China, what are they doing there? Is the work there different from the work they're doing in Western Europe, North America, or Japan? And finally, if they are indeed setting up these large centers and doing different types of work in different places, how are they managing and organizing for all this? So in the next few minutes, I'll try and take you through tentative answers to these questions. So let's start with the first one. This is a paper that I co-wrote with co-authors, and we started this research in 2007. And it was really to address the question of how global is multinational R&D and innovation. And what we tried to do was to be quite comprehensive and study multinationals, not just from one set of countries, but from many countries, both developed and emerging, locating in several countries, not only developed, but also emerging. And we looked at the world's largest corporations. We looked at the so-called Fortune 500, which cover a large set of major industries, such as the ones listed there. We excluded financial services because they are slightly different category. And we looked at where the Fortune 500, minus financial services, located their R&D in the top 21 locations. And you'll see from this list that that includes some of the triad economies that people have mentioned, but also some important emerging economies such as China and India. This took us some time to do. In some cases, like in GM I showed you, it was quite easy to gather from their websites. In other cases, we wanted to make, make sure that these were significant locations where large amounts of money had been spent, large numbers of people were employed, and they were doing significant innovation work. By doing this, we were able to collect quite a significant data set. Uh, we found that of these Fortune 500 companies, there were about 1,400 R&D facilities in these 21 countries. So I want to draw all this data now and show you some of our results. And this is just a sample of companies that originate in these different countries. I want to tell you, about five things. Which countries have the most R&D centers in general of those 21? Then I want to break that up. Which countries tend to export more R&D? Which countries import or benefit from foreign firms doing R&D in their countries? And who benefits net? Third, what is the effect of firm size or on R&D location? Third, and fourth, how does this vary across industries? And finally, what are the drivers of R&D location? What makes a country attractive to R&D investment from outside the country? So first, <coughs> total R&D centers. This is not very surprising, at least as far as the top four are concerned. The US, Germany, Japan, and UK are amongst the largest economies in the world by GDP. So it's not surprising that they have a large number of R&D centers. What was surprising to us was that in 2007, 
China was fifth and India was seventh. And we were sure that if we had done this research in say 1997, 10 years before, China and India may not have been in this list at all. So they had caught up, they were standing stuck in a matter of about 10 years. And if we did the research now, they might be even higher. But that's total R&D centers. What about the fear of people, especially policy makers, that developed countries are losing investment and jobs because companies from their countries are exporting R&D? Which countries export the most? Now, again, I would say it's not surprising that these countries are at the top because they're the largest economies in the world. But nevertheless, this could be alarming for policymakers to see that the US, US companies have 253 R&D centers outside the US. But then we say that it's important to look at the other statistic. Which countries attract R&D from outside? And again, it's interesting to note that the US, Germany, and UK are at the top. So R&D, unlike manufacturing, is not a zero-sum game. It's a two-way street. You export, but you also, if you are an open and sophisticated economy, attract R&D as well. Of course, at the moment, China and India benefit a lot from inward. But I would argue that over time, they will start exporting R&D, particularly as their companies grow. So at the moment, at least, some countries benefit more than others. China and India at the top. But you'll see countries like the UK, for instance, also benefit. They have a net uh, uh, import of R&D over export. Just to my point about how Indian and Chinese companies, as they grow, are very likely to want a global footprint and start exporting R&D to other countries. We found that in our data, as the revenues of a company increase, as it grows bigger, it's total number of R&D centers, so its footprint increases as a positive correlation, and also the extent to which they go into other countries increases. So the larger the firm, the more global it wants its innovation or R&D footprint to be, and the more globalized it is. And this is why I feel confident that in the next few years, as we see Indian and Chinese and other emerging market companies grow and enter the Fortune 500, they too will start to do R&D in Western developed economies. In fact, in the year we did the study, we had Tata Motors in there. Shortly thereafter, they acquired Jaguar Land Rover, and in the process, got access to R&D centers in the developed world. Uh, and that process continues, whereby emerging economy companies are trying to get global, a global footprint and catch up with Western companies by acquiring technology and R&D. Now, of course, this extent of globalization varies across industries. Some industries are more protected, in some industries knowledge is more sticky, in others it's more codifiable and so forth. So we found quite a significant variation in the extent of globalization across sectors. And that again is quite an interesting uh, effect. Finally, what makes a country attractive as a destination for R&D? There are many possible reasons why a country might attract R&D investment from outside. For instance, a country that might have a very large GDP. Very large economy might be attractive as a, as a market and so forth. Or a country that is growing very fast might be attractive. Some countries may have strong intellectual property um, uh, regulation and that might attract, attract investment. But in our interviews, when we talk to companies and ask them why, for instance, they were going to places like India and China, the answer they gave us was access to talent. Above all, it seemed they were going to places in India and China to be able to access the large workforce, particularly in science and technology, that these countries generate. And the Honorable Minister mentioned how Western economies, unfortunately, don't seem to be able to attract, or universities don't seem to be able to generate as many students, in Britain this is a problem, in the sciences and technology. So we wanted to test these, and with our data we could, and we found that indeed, the talent point seemed to outweigh all the other drivers. When we put all these together, talent swamped the effects of the other factors. And we concluded that the access to, especially PhDs uh, in sciences and technology was a big driver of the attractiveness of a country and R&D investment from outside. So R&D is two-way, unlike manufacturing, 
It's substantial, out particularly to India and China at the moment. It increases with the size of the company and varies across industry, and it seems largely driven by access to people with degrees in science and technology. This brings me to my second question. So what are companies doing in these R&D centers in places like India and China? Is the nature of that work different from what they would do at headquarters in North America or Western Europe? Well, if we think about innovation, <clears throat> it's possible to think about it as consisting of three steps. First, one has to be inspired, one has to get ideas. Then those ideas have to be developed and eventually commercialized. Now, each of those activities could happen in one or more place. They could be focused in developed markets or emerging markets. And we can see all of those things being done in one place or being split up. Now, traditionally, I would argue, as the literature would, that all of that was typically done in developed economies. They provided the inspiration for ideas, the development happened there, and the commercialization happened there. And maybe some of those products would eventually make their way to emerging markets. So let's see what's happened in the 21st century. This is GE's uh, R&D center in Bangalore. It's called the Jack Welch Technology Center. It is their largest um, R&D center outside the US. It's a 120 million state-of-the-art facility, which uh, has about 3,000 scientists. So this is a very large captive center big investment. And if you look at what they do there, I can't say I understand any of those things, but I know that this is not specifically for the Indian market. So to a great extent, what GE is doing there is labor arbitrage. They're taking, or they were taking advantage of the large pool of scientific talent, relatively globally competitive, at much lower prices initially, although that's been changing, in order to work on projects driven out of headquarters, typically for global consumption. This is what happened perhaps in the first phase of their life in India. This is IBM in India. It too has its largest center outside the US in India. Again, that 3000 number crops up, you can see it again. And if you look at what they're doing, again, these are things that are not specifically for the Indian market. This too looks like a kind of labor arbitrage typically projects driven out of headquarters, employing locals who are pretty competent at a relatively lower cost. Intel in India, you can see that 3,000 number again. And this is a, a press report in 2007 about how half of the work on India, Intel's Teraflop research chip was done in India. And again, I think this is, is confirms my view that this was a project driven out of headquarters using Indian talent to work on it, not specifically for the local market. And to give you an example from another context, China, this is GSK, which um, in 2006 set up an R&D center in Shanghai to look specifically at solutions for central nervous system diseases, and the intention there was to build on the quality of Chinese science in this area, starting with 50 employees, growing to 1,000 in 10 years. So it, using, accessing the local scientific talent. And this trend continues. It's not as if the pace with which setting up these centers has decreased. This is a recent report which suggests that the trend has continued to, to increase. But what has changed, I would argue, is what they are doing in these R&D centers. They started with this kind of labor arbitrage. But increasingly, I would argue what they're doing is focusing much more on problems of the emerging market, looking at the opportunities in the emerging market, developing solutions for those opportunities in the emerging market, and commercializing these in the emerging market. And then potentially in some cases, actually taking those solutions back to the developed world. And Mr. Kelson mentioned uh, good enough product, projects, and I think that's the kind of thing you're starting to see. Now, why are you starting to see this? Why is GE, for instance, starting to do that, uh, in that kind of innovation in India? Let's take a look at the demog demography of a country like India. You'll see, yes, there are quite a few people up there. This is the consuming class. This is the so-called middle class. Not quite the uh, same purchasing power as the equivalents in the West, 
but these will be people from the metros, uh, uh, these will be people who are salaried, uh, these are people who will be fairly educated, and will have similar preferences to their counterparts in developed economies. So yes, this is quite a large number of people, and this has been the focus of the attention of a lot of multinationals and also large Indian companies. However, I'd like to draw your attention to the group just below and perhaps even below that. These are even larger in number. These are people who might be, say, in urban slums, maybe migrants, or people in the countryside, richer farmers, and so forth. These are very large numbers of people who have not been the focus of attention, typically, of the large corporations, whether Western or Indian. Yet, these are people who are increasingly aspirational. They are low income, but they have some purchasing power, which is always increasing. And most importantly, there isn't, hasn't been much competition for their custom relative <coughs> to this group where there is a lot of competition. So there are huge opportunities in the middle and even lower down in this demographic structure. But in order to take advantage of those huge opportunities, companies have to rethink how they innovate. They have to innovate around good enough products where affordability is the key, but they also have to be able to ensure accessibility of these solutions. So while there's a huge opportunity, it is not a trivial task reaching these people. It requires a new type of innovation that is frugal, affordable, flexible, inclusive. And in India, if you ask people how they characterize that kind of innovation, more often than not, particularly in North India, they use this word, jugaad. And so my co-authors and I use that word uh, in the title of our book, which we call Jugaad Innovation, where we define Jugaad as the art of overcoming harsh constraints by improvising an effective, good enough solution, not a perfect solution, using limited resources. And the interesting thing is that while we were writing the book, we heard from people around the world that there were equivalents of this kind of approach in their own context, such as in Brazil, in Kenya, China, and even in the developed world where you have the DIY movement or the maker movement, where people apply similar principles. Now, why does the world need Jugaad? I would argue that India, in some cases, is a microcosm, in some ways, is a microcosm for the rest of the world. You saw the pyramid for India, here's the pyramid for the world. The World Resources Institute of the World Bank, in a recent report, or 2008 report, about the next four billion, says that there are four billion people who are at the bottom of the world's economic pyramid. These are people who earn less than $9 a day PPP, that's about $3,000 PPP per annum, and these are people who are typically outside the formal economy. So they're unbanked, they don't have access to electricity, uh, they do not have access to good healthcare or education. But they are a huge aspirational, potential, untapped market. The World Resources Institute estimates that this market is worth something like $5 trillion, which is more or less the size of the Chinese economy. And of course, this group is growing. This is its size today. So coming back to our story about what some of these large corporations are doing, say in India, let's look at GE. As I mentioned, GE has its largest R&D center outside the US in Bangalore. And before they were, and even now, mostly doing labor arbitrage, developing products for Western consumption. But more recently, they've started doing things like this. This is an ECG machine that they've developed initially specifically for the Indian market. Now, what GE realized was that what they typically did, let's say with ECG machines, was they take their machines that were developed for Western markets and then perhaps defeature them a bit lower the price a bit and try to sell them in countries like India. But doing that would only get them access to maybe 30% of the market, typically the larger cities where there were hospitals that could afford these kinds of products. But for the countryside, you simply would not be able to sell this. Instead, you typically have doctors going from the city to the countryside serving uh, people in the countryside. So they realized if they were going to tap into that market, they would have to completely rethink the nature of their products for that market. The products would have to be portable, they would have to be highly affordable, they would have to run on batteries, be robust, and be in some ways good enough. So they decided to come up from, with a, a product like this. 
And instead of doing it the old way, that is doing it themselves, reinventing the wheel in a sense and owning all the IP, they decided to take a leaf out of the book of some of their competitors, both the Chinese and Indian medical device manufacturers, and apply this kind of Jugad approach. So they knew that they needed some kind of printer. So instead of creating their own, they looked around and they discovered that bus ticket printers would do very well. So they took that component. They needed some kind of keypad. So phones have keypads and things like that. They took that component. And in this way, they have cut and paste existing off-the-shelf components to create at a global quality standard, a product that is suited to the market. They could do this frugally and very quickly, importantly. It was successful in India, very successful in China. Now it has FDA approval and is selling in Western Europe and North America. GE has continued to do things like this. Um, this is an ultrasound device. Uh, um, you know, I have young kids and I remember going to the National Health Service in the UK. You get two scans in a nine month period of the, uh, of the fetus and that's because it's very expensive. You have very large ultrasound machines which need a specialist. This is very expensive. GE realized that it is possible to actually come up with something that doctors say in the Indian countryside might use like they use a thermometer or a stethoscope. But this would have to be radically affordable, it would have to be portable and so forth. And they came up with something like this. It's a V-scan, which looks, as you can see, like a cross between a clamshell uh, phone and an, an iPod. Um, and I've you know, had this done to me by a GE person. He just, you know, when I was giving a talk, he just came up, he put the gel on my stomach and I could see my intestines on the computer screen. And not a pretty sight, but you know, this is uh, <laughs> uh, something that can be done. And then can be projected and the image can be sent electronically and so forth. Now, this is quite interesting because it wasn't done exclusively in the Indian RME center. They partnered with the RME center in Norway that had some very sophisticated uh, graphical um, technology, and this is where you start to see partnerships between developed economies and emerging economies. Now, Siemens is not far behind. Siemens has a very large R&D center in Bangalore, uh, where they are developing their own set of medical devices. Here is an example of a very affordable medical device from Siemens in Bangalore, a fetal heart monitor. So, going one up on G, they're not even using ultrasound, which is quite expensive, they're using microphone technology, which is much cheaper, to do more or less the same thing, at least to be able to check on uh, the, the uh, fetus's heart. And in fact, Siemens have built on that to create a whole range of products they call smart products. Smart, in this case, stands for simple, maintenance-free, affordable, reliable, and timely to market. The principles are very similar to these principles of Jugard. A good enough solution, quickly, that is suited to the market. And they not only do things like the medical devices, but they do products for B2B, for uh, medium-sized companies in India, industrial goods uh, markets. For instance, uh, they have these microprocessor cameras that are used in the food industry or in the engine parts manufacturing sector. Now, Nokia, in a sense, has been here before everybody else. Uh, in many ways, Nokia you know, stole a march on companies uh, and uh, were in many ways seen as an Indian company, uh, equally, I'm sure, as a Chinese company. Uh, for a long time, they had something like 60% of market share. They're not doing so well now, but they were for a very long period of time. And how did they do this? They did this by shifting R&D and manufacturing to India and having local teams respond to the local market in weeks, not months. And employees were empowered to criticize management decisions and contribute ideas to improve performance. So they operated pretty much like a company that was based in India, responding to Indian needs, and not run out of headquarters that was in some other market context. Uh, out of that kind of approach came many very successful products. And here's another example of the sort of good enough products specifically for particularly people in urban slums. Nokia employs people they call global nomads who are trained in anthropology and ethnography. And these people would actually live with potential customers. So they would live with people in the slum, say, of Dharavi. If you have seen um, uh, Slum Dog Millionaire, you know what I'm talking about, or people in Ghana or people in Sao Paulo. And they would observe how they used mobile phones. And this was in the late 
1990s. So they noticed that uh, people, say, in a slum in India would buy mobile phones. Now, it was quite expensive for them then. It was a very prized possession. So one of the first things they would do would be to cover it in plastic to protect it from dust and grime. Another thing they noticed was that people would use the light in the phone to see their way in the dark. So they said, why don't we just put a few features into this basic, robust, affordable phone, which responds to needs of local people. And that's what they did. They came up with this basic 1100 series, very robust, basic, affordable phone that has these features, particularly the built-in flashlight. And this made it tremendously successful in the marketplace. Uh, to so much so that at one point it was the world's best-selling consumer electronics uh, device. And increasingly, specific, especially because they are facing pressure on the handsets, they're thinking of services that can be delivered on mobile devices. Services, for instance, with mobile payments or end health solutions or information to farmers on prices uh, of crops and so forth. And they have a thriving local ecosystem of third-party developers, smaller companies, local companies that work for Nokia, Nokia and a symbiotic relationship. And as a result, it is seen as an Indian company, very often rated number one, the number one brand, the most trusted brand in India. Now, as I alluded earlier, some of these experiences of Western multinationals in India can also have implications for their operations back home. This is Victoria Colau of Vodafone saying a lot of the ideas from places like Africa and India can be brought back to the developed world. And this is Jeff Imant of GE, uh, who is a big believer in what he calls reverse innovation. And he believes that some of the models like the ECG machine I showed you, the products that are developed for India or China have applicability in Europe and the US. And of course, then the challenge is how do they manage that with their current high-end products, how do they brand them, and so forth. Let me conclude by talking about the final point. So if companies are indeed globalized in innovation, and in addition to their R&D centers in the West, also have these big centers in places like India, China, Brazil, etc. How do they manage all this? How do they manage this complexity? So let's go back to this uh, simple diagram. And you know, one might say that this is how innovation happened traditionally for most of the 20th, 20th century. The locus, the focus was the advanced economies, and then there might have been some trickle down of products to developing economies. And then we saw, for instance, in the 90s, the beginnings of this starting to change with, say, IT, back office stuff, where some of the development might have happened in places like India, but again, the focus being there, and then maybe the products would trickle back to uh, markets like India. I would argue that now we're starting to see a bit of the reverse process happening, particularly with these good enough products, these products that are suited to low-income groups, which, of course, you have particularly in emerging economies, but you also have in developed economies, particularly with pressure on household budgets and government budgets. So you might see this trajectory, or you might see a trajectory like this, particularly for companies from emerging markets, such as the Tata Group, and I'll talk a little bit about them in a minute. In fact, what I would argue is that in the next few years, next couple of decades, we will see a convergence between Western multinationals who traditionally did innovation in, in the West uh, and emerging market multinationals who are now doing innovation in their home countries. We'll see a convergence where, where both sides aspire to a global footprint where they develop products for the high end throughout the world and products for the low end throughout the world in different locations with cooperation between the R&D centers. You will see something like that, something that we call polycentric innovation, which basically <laughs> means that companies will strive to build global innovation networks that will look something like this. You will see centers in various parts of the world, and those centers will be in clusters where they integrate locally with smaller firms within that cluster, and then between clusters through their R&D networks. So you will see that both in developed and developing economies linked in this kind of a net. And that's what I would argue you're starting to see already a bit of that with GE, which in their Bangalore center developed this uh, machine that uh, was inspired by the local market, commercialized there, and now moving back to uh, some Western markets. 
with the vscan as i said some of the development actually happened in a developed economy already center in norway where they have some sophisticated technology that they use but the objective is to commercialize in both locations let me talk a little bit about cisco i mentioned earlier that they have their second headquarters in bangalore and this is again john chambers at the inauguration of it that center has become a global hub with the mandate to look at telemedicine uh, solutions and here you see some of their telemedicine solutions now you would ask why would they want to do that in india well they see india as a lab we were talking about a living lab but india is seen as a lab to develop affordable innovations in the space such as telemedicine because you have the need you have a huge need for telemedicine you have a huge potential market and you have potential solutions and workforce and talent to develop those solutions so you have all the ingredients you would need to actually develop global competency in one place to come up with solutions that may have application not only in india but also related emerging economies and potentially also in the developed world so i would argue that cisco's sort of innovation networks a bit like this they were initially inspired by the indian market a lot of development is now co-development between the developed market and the emerging market counterparts and their aspiration is to commercialize both in the developed and the emerging world. Let me talk a little bit about Xerox. Xerox came a bit late to the party in India. They set up their R&D center in 2008, where most of these other companies probably set up in the early 2000s. And they did it somewhat differently. Rather than set up a big captive center like the ones I showed you, rather than have a big campus with 3,000 people, they set up a small, very networked office in Chennai with about 100 people. And they built on pre-existing relationships they had, not only with local industry, but importantly, local academia. And this goes back to some of the goals of the Danfoss Center, Global Business. The importance of linking academia with business. So what they did was, they, they located close to IIT Madras, one of the top uh, uh, engineering institutions in India, where there was quite a bit of research on rural solutions. Uh, and they also integrated with the local ecosystem of small startups that were developing solutions for those needs. And the people they had in the center were sort of bilingual. They were both technically competent and had a business background. And I think what Xerox was able to do was quite clever. They were able to do with a small set of resources what some other companies had done with much larger resources. And since then, they have expanded that to Bangalore, working closely with the Indian Institute of Science and some other companies there. And I think this is what Xerox is aspiring to do. Xerox is basically doing what I was saying earlier, has, is creating a kind of polycentric global innovation network, which brings together their expertise in Palwan's research center and their links to companies there with what they're doing in India and what they're doing in China and the expertise in those countries. A little bit about the Indian companies, such as the Tata, Tata Group. I mentioned Tata Motors. Uh, one of the things they've become quite well known for is the Tata Nano Car, which is a classic example of a good enough product, the world's cheapest car, uh, which was developed in India, but not only for and inspired by India, but not only for India, the objective was to be able to, in the long run, also sell it in, in Europe, for instance. And since they acquired Jaguar Land Rover, they also now have R&D capabilities in the UK and in Norway, and then one of their big projects is to develop an electric car. Again, one that was inspired both by emerging and developed economies. The focus of development is there. Initially, they will commercialize in the West, and then the hope is to commercialize in India. And I would say that, again, this is what Tata Motors, from the Indian side, is aspiring to, much like what Xerox has done from the Western side. So let me conclude by saying the following. I would argue that emerging markets pose challenges, but also offer significant opportunities, especially in the middle of the economic pyramid, as I showed you, where incomes are low, but rising, and aspirations are high, and where there isn't much competition. But reaching those segments will require a particular type of innovation. It's kind of a Jugard approach, low cost, high volume, multidimensional. 
Emerging markets like India can provide a lab to develop and test new ideas with large local markets with the potential to then serve global markets. Innovators in emerging markets can build strong brands with global consequences. So what does this mean for Danish companies? I would say for the large Danish companies like Danfoss, countries like India or China offer an opportunity in many ways. So one, access to talent. You get access to scientists and engineers in larger numbers than you may have access to in the West. And initially at least at a relatively lower cost. But more importantly, I would say, it gives you access to new ideas and new potential markets. You can come up with products, good enough products, which do very well in emerging markets where the growth is, but which may also do well in the West. And these could complement your existing focus on high-end, high-value products and services. What about smaller or medium-sized Danish companies? Well, I take your point that it can be quite daunting for those kinds of companies to go to places like India and China, which are, I can assure you, scarier than jumping off that bridge. <laughs> <laughs> but what could you do? There is an opportunity there. I think one thing you can do is to partner with your larger Danish counterparts. And you can do that here without having to go there. I'm not saying you shouldn't go there, you can go there, but I think an easier way is to partner with larger counterparts here. Working on solutions for those emerging markets. This is what happens quite a bit in a place like Cambridge. There are Cambridge companies that are either on their own trying to develop solutions for emerging markets. If they're small, they tend to partner with the larger firms like Arm that are doing that. So that's where I'd like to conclude. Thank you very much.